Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Riverfront. This is episode number 463 of the World's Most Dangerous Podcast, where we discuss the Cincinnati Reds and occasionally Herm Winningham. I'm your host, Chad Dotson, and with me again this week, your friend and mine, Nate. How are you, Nate? It's nice that you call me your friend after all these years. I appreciate that. <laughs> warm warm the soul. I'm great, Chad. How are you? Could not be better. We get got some, uh, you know, Nick Crawl talk today. We got some uh, fun talk and, and sort of an extension of our topic last week. And I'm I'm excited to hear how you've got a you got a hot take you want to lay on me. I, I think is the way I'm going to preview that this. <laughs> so um, before we go further, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, smash the subscribe button. If you listen to the audio version, subscribe. I promise my voice will not sound like this every week. You can tell I'm maybe a little under the under the weather, but uh, as Nate has been. Um, but he's uh, feeling better today, I guess. And uh, the show must go on, we've decided. So you get to listen to this ridiculous accent now in a little bit deeper tone. Um, and so we're everywhere you find podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Audible. I don't know, wherever. Um, so, Nate, the uh, topic of the week, Oscar nominations were announced. Did you uh, Were you eagerly anticipating the Oscar nominations? Yeah, we decided to uh, change this from a baseball podcast to a, to a movie podcast for one week only. I was eagerly awaiting these nominations. I, I think if you were not my brother, I probably wouldn't care as much as I do. Um, but there was, a, as most of the listeners know, once I've been around for a little while, I lived in China for several years. And there was an unofficial holiday over there because piracy is not illegal. So you're just always every day you get on and you and then check Pirate Bay or whatever for the latest drops. But on one day, whenever the uh, screeners went out for all the Academy Award nominees, they would all drop on the same day, usually a few weeks before they're announced to the public. So that was the uh, it's something that we look forward to every year because you know what you're you know what you're watching for the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to do the same thing this year, just legally. There we go. You are encouraged to legally download this show as well. It's uh. It's not against the law, except, except at Great American Ballpark in the front office. Uh, not allowed to, not allowed to listen to the show in, in, in the offices. Can you imagine some intern bopping along down the hallway and listening to the world's most dangerous podcast and Phil, Phil, where's that coming from? Um, so this, we're, this is not a uh, movie podcast for the week. Uh, that's not exactly a true statement I just made. We're going to get back to baseball in just a moment. But I, I am the one guy that uh, is... Really excited about the Oscar nominations this year and uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. 11 nominations. That's the most. Nate, uh, were you surprised? And, for, and have you seen everything, everywhere, all at once? I have indeed um, because of your recommendation. It is my front runner so far, but my uh, my dark horse was also nominated. That's Banshees of Inna Sharon. Mm, both great movies. Enjoyed both of them, both in my top five of the year. And, and I know you eagerly anticipate this as well. Uh, in the coming weeks, right before the uh, Oscar ceremony, I will release my list of the top 25 Ooh. movies of that I saw in 2022. So, yeah, I was happy for uh, for that. I was uh, happy to see probably my favorite movie that I think, if I were voting, I think I'd probably vote for The Fablemans uh, in the Best Picture race. But, um, you know, some other good ones. Uh, Tar, Top Gun Maverick. Amazing! I'm so happy Top Gun Maverick got nominated. You know, yeah, little crowd pleaser. That's um, my that's my big takeaway from the whole thing is thank God they're finally nominating some blockbusters again. I mean, in 20 yeah. years, everybody's going to remember Avatar and Top Gun Maverick. Nobody's going to remember Nomad Land or whatever it was from a few years ago, or that one where that weird lady's bumping uglies with a fish. <laughs> we don't need to watch. I don't need to watch Grinding Nemo. <laughs> oh no! That was a good movie. The Shape of Water, good movie. Also very, very strange. Yes. So, anyway, um, nothing else to say about that really. Although I could talk about it for an hour. The snubs, the non-snubs. Really disappointed that Babylon didn't get nominated. One of my favorites of the year. Uh, maybe my favorite of the year. But um, I think everything, everywhere, all at once is the leader for the Best Picture race and. Uh, Mostly because short round from uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is in it. Big comeback. And he got nominated for an Oscar. It's fantastic. So, um, anything else uh, this week, Nate? There's Joey uh, Votto still playing chess. Did you see on his Instagram, he uh, posted like a, it looked like it's the front page of his local newspaper, had an article about him and chess and um, mm -hmm. 
I don't know, the, the Joey Votto's taking over the chess world, and I'm here for it. It's been great. On uh, one of his recent wins, he credited Barley Soup for uh, powering him to victory. And I, was, <laughs> I was wondering, I had, to, I had to look it up, if that's a real thing or just a Canadian term for beer. But uh, apparently it is indeed a, a kind of soup. Um, did you happen to catch Joey's interview on uh, the Chris Rose rotation? I did not. You mentioned that. And I was going to try to catch that, and I didn't do it. Was it how it interesting was that? Was fantastic. It's a quick listen to only like 30, 35 minutes or something. But uh, Chris Rose is one of the best interviewers in the game, and uh, Joey was fantastic. He talked about, and they touched on it in the article too, about how uh, he met Gary Kasparov, and apparently Joey tells the story that. Um, they were in St. Louis, and he ran out to go introduce himself, and Gary Kasparov probably didn't know who he was. But he mentioned that he was playing someone online in chess at that moment. They had a game going, and that Gary Kasparov, a grandmaster, one of, if not the greatest chess player of all time, it's like, can I see? And he gave Joey the move to beat this guy online by, sacri- <laughs> by, by sacrificing his queen. He's like, he wishes he could you know, reach out to that other guy and say, it wasn't me to beat you. It's it also but, Gary Kasparov. The other thing that I found most fascinating, though, is that Joey said that he had tickets to the World Cup to a few um, of the early matches and decided not to go because his rehab was progressing so well that he didn't want to throw a wrench in that. So that's great. That's, that's great. That's, that's good news. Yeah. Yeah. And David Bell talked a little bit about that. And we'll talk, maybe mention that just a little while um, at the uh, at one of the caravan stops. So we do need to get to the, you know, what we're here to talk about, the Cincinnati Reds. Oh. Uh, but actually, before that, before that, the biggest news of the week was not the Oscars. It was not Joey playing chess or being on, uh, you know, Charlie Rose or whatever. Um, it's this. And if you're not watching on YouTube, you're just missing it. Where is that? Georgetown Hoyas. <laughs> the Georgetown Hoyas, after losing 29 consecutive games in the Big East, knocked off the DePaul Blue Demons after almost blowing a 10-point lead in the final minute, um, and uh, got Patrick Ewing his first win in almost two calendar years in the Big East. Uh, they had not won a game. Uh, they had not actually won a Big East game since the Big East tournament that they won, um, amazingly. So Patrick Ewing, someone asked me this week what I thought, thought of Patrick Ewing. I said, that guy's a legend, best player in program history. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So, yes, I'll explain to you on Twitter why. I, you hear me talk about Virginia all the time. I have a right to – Talk about Georgetown as well. I've actually been a fan of Georgetown much longer. Okay, enough of that. I've been a fan of the Reds for even longer, Nate. The topic of the week, and you came up with this idea for a topic of the week um, for this week a, a few weeks ago, and I'm intrigued. My first thought was uh, shrug emoji. Um, <laughs> why the Reds will be contenders. And I was like, I can't make that case. But then we talked last week, we talked a little bit of the best case scenario something you've talked about constantly, which is, uh, you know, hope springs eternal this time of year. You start mm-hmm. uh, getting hopeful. And and uh, and so you kind of – I said it was earlier. I, I previewed it as being a hot take. But uh, I think I like the way you're thinking here. So tell me, Nate, answer this question that we all want to hear. Why will the Reds be contenders this year? Well, the quick answer is that, as, you know, Sarah's pointed out, they probably won't. But I wanted to look at what – some other contending teams, um, what their rosters looked like and the production they had from their main guys and see how how much you had to squint to envision the Reds having something similar. So what I did was I looked at last year's Philadelphia Phillies, who were, uh, you know, most people assume an offensive heavy team that was the last team in on the playoffs you know, before their big run to the World Series, and also the Milwaukee Brewers because they're, you know, typically um, a pitching dominant team and they were only one game behind the Phillies. So I thought that would be a good barometer for where the Reds could, uh, could hope to be if they're going to sneak into playoff contention. And those teams and, contended for the playoffs last year. So this is a, a, a really good, uh, interesting analog uh, way to look at this. Yeah. And so by looking at these two teams, I found some really striking, actually um, surprised how quickly they jumped out to me. Similarities, between production. So we'll just go sort of position group by position group. I'll throw out what I found and bounce it off you. Uh, But let's start at the top because I think this is what really, really needs to happen for the Reds to be good this year. And that's with starting pitching. So both of those teams, Brewers and Phillies, had three starting pitchers with over 150 innings pitched 
and an ERA plus over 100. You immediately think that's that's feasible. Like I can envision a world where Hunter Green, Nicodolo, and Graham Ashcraft hit that mark. Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely feasible. As soon as you said that, I'm like, well, gosh, we, I expect these guys to do that this year. You know, maybe I shouldn't. And there's always going to be injuries, all that. You know, we, we have to constantly uh, remind ourselves. But if those three guys just improve a little bit on where they were last year and are able to pitch 150 innings, yeah, there's 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 no reason. And I think something else you said is something that I hadn't really, you know, thought about, which is that I think if the Reds, I think I agree with what you just said, and I hesitate ever to do that, but if the Reds are going to be good, it's going to depend on the pitching. It's gonna it's gonna be have to be on the backs of the pitching. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of moving parts have to go right on the offensive side of the ball to have a significantly above average offense or even an average offense maybe. Um, and, and it wasn't uh, wasn't good last year, but the pitching has that sort of room for growth that um, we don't have. Well, we do have some room for growth, but I'm just not sure we're having the growth this year on the offensive side. We'll talk about that in a moment. But for um, for the pitchers, gosh, I just I, I, you don't have to squint. You don't, have, don't even have to squint to see those three guys: Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, and Graham Ashcraft um, being the most exciting trio of young pitchers that any team has in baseball and uh, they're going to get thrown in the fire this year because it's going to be all on them. Now there's no Luis Castillo for half a season. There's no, you know, uh, Tyler Malley. It's a, uh, it's on them and I, it's time for them to step up. Love it. They can do it. Yeah. And I think that's what's so frustrating about uh, losing Castillo and Malley last year. Love the guys they got for them. Carl did great. Yeah. Star thumbs up exclamation point. But there have been plenty of playoff teams throughout history that have, um, ridden the uh, the wave of a strong rotation that would have been worse than what I think those five guys will do this year for their respective teams. But that's for another podcast or every other podcast that we do. So um, the only other thing about the rotation is that um, both of those teams had a back-end guy that threw under 100 innings, or the multiple back-end guys, that also had a strong ERA plus, over 100. So there needs to be some depth there. And that's that's a big question mark for this team. But uh, you know, is it a Brandon Williamson type? Is it you know Justin Dunn? I don't know how many innings you're going to get from Luis Sessa, but that's another hole they're going to need to fill in if they hope to contend. Johnny Cueto would have been an obvious choice there. Yeah, this is one where you have to squint a little bit harder uh, to see mm-hmm. it, or you know, um, it's the best case scenario like we were talking about because I'm not sure that they have the depth to withstand injuries or just to withstand what you need. I mean, you're, you're going to need eight, nine starting pitchers every season. And if you could if you could have two that are reliable in the back end, and they could, they certainly could. There's some really intriguing names. I, I, still, we've been saying it, but they should have gone out, and they, they still could technically, although more about Nick Cross comments in a moment, uh, go out and get a veteran. That's just what I wanted. I wanted a veteran mm-hmm. to uh, – we say Cueto because we love Cueto and he has a history here, but the Cueto type – a veteran who's been through the wars and could help bring these kids along. Um, so I don't know. There are Williamson is one name that's really intriguing to me. He comes uh, fairly. Uh, he's he's just intriguing. That's the word I think for him. Intriguing. He could be the guy. He could be the Graham Ashcraft that surprises everyone at an, at a, almost out of nowhere. Um, I'm not sure he's he's as quite as husky as Graham Ashcraft, but we can't all be perfect. Um, so yeah, that's I'm squinting a little bit more there, but I think you've identified that's 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 going to be a key. Yeah, and luck is always involved. Uh, and when luck is involved, you need to talk about the bullpen, which is where we're going to go next. Both of those squads had five guys with over 30 innings pitched and 100 100 plus ERA plus. And the reason I just used ERA plus and OPS plus throughout these is because they're easily digestible. Uh, for those that don't know, it just the any number over 100 in these stats is what percentage these players are better than the average guy. Yeah, this well, is just a quick and, quick and dirty way to to do this analysis and without getting yeah. too deep into the weeds. We're not saying these people need to be all-stars, need to be world beaters, but just better than average. Um, again, bullpen, five guys. You got to find that. It's not crazy to get there. It's not difficult to get there with the Reds. Um, Alexis Diaz was there. Buck Farmer did that last year, the which I was a little bit surprised by. Also surprised by a young Jeffrey Hoffman did it last year. 
free agent still out there for uh, for anybody to go snatch up. And then newly signed uh, to a minor league deal, Alex Young was only four innings pitched away from doing that last year. So there is three three out of five right there. Well, we've got a couple guys named Lucas Sims Bingo. and TJ Antone that are waiting in the wings. We did get some injury news on TJ Antone today. It doesn't sound like it's too uh, too terrifying, but if those guys can somehow be healthy and get you anywhere close to a full season, there's your five. You, you never know with relievers, obviously, year to year. Alexis Diaz could be not good next year. I don't expect that to happen, but um, you, you, you just don't know. The biggest wild card on the entire pitching staff, to me, is Lucas Sims and TJ Antone. Because when they've been good, they've been really good. They have not been... Um, you know, since the sticky stuff was banned, they have not been great, but they've been mostly injured. But at their best, those guys are just magical. Um, Antone especially, but mm-hmm. but Sims as well. So, uh, again, we're going to talk about lots of what ifs and scenarios. But that to me is if this if this chant team ha- is going to have any chance of being remotely interesting, those two guys have to be healthy yeah. because then we get to a situation where no matter how good your starters are, we have like we had in. Uh, you know, uh, what year was that where the bullpen just blew every single game? And uh, that's every year, I think. I looked it up. It was every year where the bullpen blew every single game. So, yeah, no, I think that's – I think you're right. There Again, we're squinting a little bit there. But when you're squinting, you're squinting at two guys that have a history, that, that have, you know, um, excelled at times. So That's right. We know, we know who to squint towards. And there's going to be a ton of bullpen fodder running through the, through the system. So you, you, but you need five guys, apparently five reliable guys that are up there for most of the year. Um, moving on to the position players, both teams again had six guys with at least 350 at bats and an OPS plus over 100. So six above average offensive players. The Reds did not have that last year. As a matter of fact, they only had one player who reached that metric last year. And that was Brandon Drury, who I think had exactly 350 at bats. So if you want to, you know, wrap your head around how much time they need to spend on the field, Brandon Drury as a red. So we're going to be squinting a little bit harder here, but when you start breaking it down, it gets to be a little more possible. Um, let's just go around the diamond. We'll start with Tyler Stevenson. Um news around the caravan that we'll talk about a little bit later. I fully expect a healthy Tyler Stevenson to put up all-star caliber numbers, um, if not better. I could not be higher than I am on Tyler Stevenson. So if he's healthy, there's one guy right there. I'm in. I'm in. Joey Votto. Joey Votto has done this every season of his career that he's had enough at-bats to qualify except for one. And that was in 2019. So it's not crazy to think that he can be an above average offensive player. I'm counting on it. I'm expecting it. I'm I'm guaranteeing that. Today, I'm guaranteeing it. Love it. Moving around, Jonathan India. He had a 91 OPS plus last year. It was 116 his rookie year. So if you think he's nowhere nearly, nearly as bad as he was last year, and maybe you don't think he's quite as good as he was his rookie year. Even so, if he settles somewhere in the middle, he probably finishes up with an OPS plus above 100. And I would say as well that that OPS plus settled at 91 after a horrific start to the season. He kind of, you know, he yeah. built it back up. So, yeah, no, I expect him to be an R. So, we got three. That's Feeling right. good about this. Feeling good. Um, it starts getting a little dicier here if we're just moving around, around the diamond. Shoot over to third base real quick. Spencer Steer. As we talked about at length um, with Matt Wilkes a couple weeks ago, Fangrass is the highest on him of just about anybody else, and they project him to have a 98 OPS plus, which would not qualify. But slight uptick there, and he's your fourth guy. I think he has the potential to be a 100 OPS plus guy, if not a little bit better. So I don't think that's crazy. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. There would be your fourth. We still need six. Short stop. Oh. This is the biggest question mark, right? Um, 
We lost the immortal Kevin, uh, Kyle Farmer. Kevin Newman actually wasn't too far off in that pace last year, though I'm not going to count on him doing that or necessarily being there all year. Um, Jose Barrero, if he taps into some of the potential that led to him being the uh, Reds' best prospect for a couple years there, but not holding my breath until I see a little more than what he's shown so far. So I don't know. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna assume that they do not have a shortstop that gets 350 plus at bats and hits at a an above average clip. I think that's just a safe the, safe assumption. Yeah, All right, the sake of this exercise. So move on to the outfield. Needing two out of three. Well, <laughs> hold on. Sorry. Shoot. <laughs> I was with you, man. I'm on this ride <laughs> with you. I'm riding the wave here, man. It's been great. But Hear me out. Hear me two out, out of three. Two out of three Reds outfitters. More than uh, uh, better than average OPS plus. Let's hear it. Well, Will Myers will be the safest bet. He has done so almost every season of his career, and that will be our fifth guy. Okay, uh, Brandon, right. Brandon Jury did it last year. Will Myers is going to be that guy this year. I, I can I can d- d- dig it. So we're missing one, and you look around, and I think the guy that would give the Reds the best chance is hold on, Jake. wait before you before you say the name. Are you aware? The Aristides Aquino is no longer in the Reds organization. Shoot. All right. Can we start over? <laughs> I don't know. We need a Go ahead. Answer. Who's your number six? Um, I think the guy is Jake Fraley. Um, last year in 216 at-bats, he had a 118 OPS plus. He did. So that sort of came out of nowhere. I certainly didn't expect it. Um, I imagine he'll be get plenty of days off, do a lot of platooning. Well, he showed some real signs last year, and if he comes anywhere close to repeating that over the course of a full season, then there's your sixth guy. Okay, you're squinting a little there. Um, <laughs> although, you know, he, he's not called Rake Fraley for nothing. Um, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I could guess I could see it. Um, really, that's the only one, though, that I really think is a, a reach. Uh, you know, I... I don't even think Spencer Steer is a reach at all. I don't. I just keep getting more and more excited about this guy. The more I look at projections and see what he, how he's hitting the minors, uh, I just I don't. I think it's going to happen. Uh, maybe not. It's tough to adjust. I mean, he he has made his debut, but this will be his first opening day and all the pomp and circumstance and having to play 162 games. Well, he won't play them all, but you know the long grind of a of a season. So that's a uh, that's interesting. The one that I. Um, I thought you you may make this um, leap of faith. I thought you were going to go with uh, Jose Barrero, and I, I wish, I desperately wish. Yeah, there was a pretty good uh, one of the caravan stops. They were talking to um, some guys, and uh, Jose Barrero was given an interview, evidently, and um, David Bell remarked on how he was confidently given an interview in English, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and Bell says something that I think all the time, which is that, you know, how, how, how much courage that takes to, to, to give an interview at his age, to give an interview in a, your second language, you know, I've been trying to learn Spanish forever and I, I couldn't do it. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know. I'm rooting for the kid because he had, he had came with such expectations and he has done nothing but fall flat on his face. Um, I, I'm not going to project it. No way. I, I think the chances are slim based on all available evidence. But he added a, he added a toe tap in his stance, evidently. <laughs> They've tried to change it to help him time it. So maybe that toe tap is going to be the key to him getting back. I, I, I yeah. expect we're going to see a lot more Kevin Newman than uh, than Barrero. Yeah, nobody wants to see that more than me. But for the sake of this exercise, I tried to find things that were uh, a little – I have a little more evidence to back up the, uh, the, the leap right. of faith that I was taking. And, man. Prove me wrong, Jose. A couple other quick things, though. Um, on the bench, those two teams, uh, before, before those Brewers and Phillies teams, each had three guys getting between 100 and 350 at-bats with an OPS plus over 100. So this is where we're paging the likes of TJ Friedel, who did it last year, Stuart Fairchild, who almost had enough at-bats to qualify, and then uh, you know we need a third guy. Uh, Kurt Casale's actually done that a couple times in his career, though I wouldn't, uh, you know, Bet the, bet, the, bet the farm on it. I'm going to go with Christian Encarnacion Strand and Matt McClain to kind of fill in this for oh, nice. I think I think that if uh, CES gets the at-bats, 
he'll have 100 OPS plus in his sleep. The guy just hits. I'm not worried about him. Matt McClain, hoping a little bit, hoping some of that potential that uh, led to the Reds drafting him comes to fruition. But it's not crazy. It's not impossible. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. I, I, it remains to be seen how much the Reds will be willing to rely on those young guys on the big league level, or if they're just willing to, you know, just throw that in the towel in April again. The only other thing that I think is worth noting, and maybe the reason why, because if you go back to this exercise, you see that the Reds are not that far away from reaching these extremely arbitrary statistics, these thresholds that I chose for the sake of my own argument. But the one thing where they actually lagged far, far behind these other two teams was that of the regular players um, that had 250 at bats or more, only uh, the worst one, the worst one on either team had an OPS plus of 83. <laughs> last, last year's Reds had three that were far, far worse than that, and a fourth far worse than that that just missed by uh, you know six six at bats. So not only do you need to have these guys that are performing well. But that depth has to be there. You can't be filling in on these off days with, you know, the dumpster fire garbage that the Reds did last year. These guys with 60 OPS pluses. So you're going to need some luck. You're going to need some guys like Alejo Lopez and uh, that Solak guy whose name I could never remember. We need those guys not to suck. Yeah. No, again, this is sort of a, you know, well, I'm not sure what the term is. I'm, I'm searching for it, but. We, we cherry pick some things here, you know, and the, it is completely arbitrary, but it's an interesting way to try to make the case because, you know, it's tough to make the case for why the Reds will contend. Um, to me, if I'm the Reds, I, you know, I guess you, you got to take what's right for the development of these kids. Uh, obviously, you got to take that into consideration, and they, they know better than I do what is needed for the development of these kids. But man, I hope they give them an opportunity to mm -hmm. just run the asylum uh, as sooner rather than later. I mean, the very second that they are probably close to being ready, get them up here. Uh, you know, get rid of the Matt Reynoldses. And, you know, again, re much respect to Matt Reynolds. Uh, he re-signed a minor league deal with the Reds. I hope he's fantastic. But He did not qualify for my metrics. Yeah. But I, I, I don't want to see him. Okay? I, 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 the guy plays hard. I had no issues with him except that I'd rather see Matt McClain. Because mm -hmm. it, it's an unknown. Maybe we'll get something. So I'm just looking for something interesting this year. And if the Reds will kind of do that, even if they're bad, and we're saying here today they're not going to be, they're going to contend. But even if they they were bad, they'd be interesting. And so um, let's start seeing those hauls, Nick Carl. So I like it, Nate. Any final thoughts? No, just that, uh, you know, there, there's – the Reds won't be out of contention until at least May. So we can tune in for a month. With excitement, <laughs> with enthusiasm, and this team's going all the way. Spring training, come on, let's go. Yeah, there we go. Maybe they win the spring training pennant. That'd be good. All right, other news of the week. First, former Cincinnati Reds third baseman Scott Rowland was elected to the Hall of Fame this year. Scott Rowland was the only player elected uh, by the baseball writers. Roland, of course, uh, known very well to Cincinnati fans for his key role on that 2010 division championship team. And um, he was here about three and a half years, but of course, most known for Philadelphia and um, St. Louis for his careers there. But he's been a guy that I've been saying for years needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, were you surprised, Nate? Were you pleased? Do you have any thoughts at all about Scott Rowland getting inducted in the Hall of Fame? Complete and utter nonsense. Surely, you remember Anti. game three of the 2012 NLD. Stop. He's out. Stop. He's out on that air alone. Just this kidding. Is his, Completely this is his just kidding, by the way. <laughs> so, for Naughty. me, I, I got one quick thought, and it's just that, you know, sometimes I miss the pre-internet days when you didn't have mountains of data to either support or refute your, your sports hot take. You know, my first reaction when asking a player A or player B is a Hall of Famer, and how you judge that guy initially is just is just what do they do? How how were they? How do you remember them? And my gut reaction was Scott Rowland, who was a firmly above average offensive player his entire career, was absolutely 
the gold standard for how defense was played at the hot corner for nearly half of my life. That's enough for me. He was he was very good at hitting the ball and one of the best with the glove to ever do it for 16 years. And if, if that's it. And if he hadn't been injured so much, that's that's what some of his counting mm-hmm. stats don't look as good because he was injured so much. But when he played, the guy was a straight Hall of Famer. Um, you know, I wrote in I pulled it up here. Let me let me find it again. To October of 2013, I wrote a piece for uh, an outlet called the Hardball Times that said it's time to add some new third baseman to Hall of Fame because there's, there's still not enough third baseman to Hall of Fame. And I said at that time, back in 2013, that um, there were three that had not been inducted yet that absolutely should be in. Uh, one of those was uh, Chipper Jones, who did make it in. And uh, the other two were Adrian Beltre and Scott Rowland. And um, and I, I discussed the case for Scott Rowland, but again, the numbers and all that stuff, I, I like looking into that because I'm a, I'm a, I've always been a Hall of Fame nerd, but my biggest memory of Scott Rowland was that as my son was just starting to play baseball, starting to get interested in baseball, I said to him one day, watch, watch when the ball's hit to Scott Rowland. His throw to first will be perfect. They'd be right at the chest of the first baseman every time. And that became something. Every time we watched the Reds, he would comment on. And he would be looking for that. And it, it seemed like it never failed. A perfect throw every time. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how he wasn't a first ballot Hall of Famer. I really don't. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just I, There aren't enough third basemen in the Hall. And so, hopefully, the next one to go in. And, and we're assuming Scott Rowland will go in with the Reds uh, logo on his cap. No, maybe not. So the next one that goes in with the Reds logo is cap, probably Mike Moustakas, you think? <laughs> Gosh. I don't know. So anyway, um, congratulations, Scott Rowland. I know you're listening, and uh, we're very happy for you. Nate, uh, the, the caravan. There was a the caravan. caravan's happening. Apparently. There is a What's caravan. What's that? It, so it there is. Was a caravan. There is a caravan. There's, yeah. there's some caravanning. Yeah, and there's a, uh, you know. There's a picture that uh, I'm looking at this uh, picture of it, and I actually recognize some of these guys. Um, three, four, the four guys that I recognize. No, there's six guys I'm looking at. I recognize five of the six. Of course, four of the five are David Bell, Jeff Brantley, Corky Miller for some reason, and Bronson Arroyo. Um, and uh, of course, Ellie De La Cruz as well. So anyway, uh, you alluded to this earlier. David Bell announced his uh, plan for Tyler Stevenson, and it's what I said all last season. If you're going to have a DH, you got Tyler Stevenson's your best offensive player. You have to have him in the lineup every day. He can't catch every day. Let him catch the majority of the games, and then you DH, first base. And that's basically what David Bell said he's going to do. And uh, I think it's a fantastic idea because I've been saying it for a while. Nate, what are your thoughts? Uh, he said the goal is to get Tyler to play 140 to 150 games. Love it. Absolutely love it. Most of those at catcher love that too. This is fantastic. And I think that the two backups they got, uh, Kirk Casale and uh, Luke, Luke Miley, or Maley, however you pronounce that, they're such a massive upgrade over the pig slop that the team threw out there last year that it makes the strategy a lot easier to attend. You know, knowing that you can put plug a guy back there who isn't horrible, which is what they did they, for almost the entire year last year, the guy behind the plate was horrible at hitting major league baseballs. Listen, just not it, it just just at Mike P- Papierski. If you're gonna talk about him, <laughs> come on, man. Sorry, Chuck Robinson, you do not deserve that. That's right. But yeah, if uh, if Tyler Stevenson does in fact get 150 games, and he can add just like a touch, a touch of touch of power, could we be thinking MVP? Oh, there's no question in my mind that he could be in that conversation. Um, it, it all comes back to health. He's got to stay healthy and he's had some fluke a- injuries and he's not been able to stay healthy. So you, and you can't predict that, but yeah, there's no question in my mind. He was clearly the best catcher in the game when he was healthy last year, in my opinion. Uh, and that's, uh, maybe that's hyperbole, but love me some, love me some Tyler Stevenson. And I love that they're, you know, going to try to play him, um, more. I don't know why they didn't do it last year. So, uh, but that's good. Um, Again, you know, Joey Votto, they updated the status of uh, Joey Votto and Nick Senzel. Uh, Votto, Bell said he wouldn't be surprised at all if he's ready by opening day, but uh, maybe just delayed a bit. Don't really have any news on Senzel. They said he's making progress. Nick Crawl, 
Reds general manager Nick Carl said that uh, he's making progress, but we'll know more when everyone's in Arizona. That uh, that comment uh, concerned me a little bit because there's been some friction between the organizations and Zell, and why are they not on the same page and monitoring it the way they are with Joey? Um, I don't know, but uh, and then of course Lucas Sims, Justin Dunn on track for spring training done one of those guys I was talking about earlier that maybe maybe some of that rotation depth and uh TJ Antone mm, a little forearm strain back. said it didn't have anything to do with that elbow so hopefully it's a it's a quick one I don't I, I follow the guy on Instagram buddy and he's doing nothing but work this offseason work and dance that's all he does <laughs> excellent good for him much like you uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No question about it. So um, other news from the caravan is that uh, Nick Carl talked some more and said, basically, he, first he did an, a, an interview with Bobby Nightingale since they inquire. And then later he kind of clarified the comments a little bit, but just the roster is pretty much set. And OK, we already we already knew that. <laughs> we knew they weren't going to spend any money to bring anyone in. That's an interesting way to ramp up excitement and enthusiasm for your, you know, public relations caravan. Um, and then at one of the stops in the caravan, he said something to the effect of, and Nate, maybe you can remember more specifically the quote, but just that, you know, last year we signed some guys right before opening day. And, you know, I'd really like to not do that this year. I'm like, what? What? You know, I mean, does that, okay. Does that need to be said? Gosh, just hire me to write your, put it in your <laughs> teleprompter. We'll take a teleprompter everywhere, and I'll load it in. Yeah, it's Nick Crawl. I feel like he had been doing so much better lately. Like he, he had a couple interviews where he's just he sounded like like a dude, like he, he was the GM speak. You know, just give us a little bit of that. We don't need. It's it's literally your job to still be scouring the landscapes for available players, guys that get DFA from other teams during spring training that. Uh, you know, could fit this ball club. But announcing that you're not going to make any changes is saying out loud that you're not doing your job. And I don't believe that he's not doing his job. I think he just said some dumb stuff, as he is wont to do. But you know, there are so many glaring and obvious ways that this roster can be improved that I hope he is, in fact, still trying to make something uh, happen. Yeah, A little jerk, some pro far, maybe? maybe? There we go. You know, it, I guess... We're not going to go deep into this because it's what we talk about all the time. It, just, it, it absolutely destroys me what the gasolines are doing to this organization. The payroll is going to be eighty-one million this year. Now that's a lot of money to me, but eighty-one million. There's so much room. Even if they just go back to spending what they were spending, you know, five years ago, you know, get up to the 120, 125 million range. That is a huge pot of money that they could spend to improve this roster, and they're not doing it because they don't care if they lose. And I just don't understand how you run a professional sports franchise. So, still team, Bob. Uh, any other caravan-related news you want to discuss, Nate? I think that pretty much covers it. Did we you did go to any of the caravan? Did you, we did have a transaction. I was going to ask if you had gone to any of the uh, caravan stops, Nate. I have actually never been to a caravan stop. I imagine it would be pretty exciting for uh, – some people over there, I did see that they announced Chris Sabo was going to be a, attending one of the stops. So uh, that's sure to that's sure to get the twelve year olds really excited. <laughs> twelve year old me would have been excited. Um, okay, so there was one transaction this week, and that was Derek Law re-signed with the Cincinnati Reds. Nate, did you know that thirty two year old relief pitcher Derek Law played for the Cincinnati Reds last year? <laughs> Only because he has a unique name. Welcome back, Buzz Derek. Up. I hope you go out and win a Cy Young, but I apologize if I don't feel compelled to wax poetic about signing retread relievers to minor league deals. No offense, though. I'm trying to talk with the mute button on, Nate. What's a, I've only done 463 episodes of this stupid show. Yeah, you've so, only done like 62 of these video ones. So. That's true. Um, no, I was, just, I was saying. Derek Law ball. <laughs> Derek Law, is, yeah, here's my prediction. He will be one of those ERA plus over 100 guys that you were count, counting on earlier. 
Derek Law, welcome back to this party that never stops. All right. Um, the other sort of news, I guess, of the week was that um, Bally Sports Ohio may be folding, and I don't really have a take on it. it probably not good, but uh, I, I, I need more information. So, Yeah, Doug, Doug Gray wrote a quick write-up on it over there at redlegnation.com, which uh, people may be familiar with. So go, go see what Doug had to say. Absolutely. Nate, you want to answer some viewer mail questions? I want nothing more in this world. All right. The viewer mail questions will begin with our friend and neighbor, Joe Farsing, one of the hosts of the award-winning podcast, The Riverfront Bengals Show. Two episodes this week, Nate, of The Riverfront Bengals Show. It's a new record. You all got a little excited over the big win. Who could? How could you not be? There's a good team in Cincinnati. So, uh, yeah, we're over there having a lot of fun. Um, riding the playoff wave of excitement as long as we can. So head on over. It's on the same YouTube channel, also in all your podcast apps. Uh, the Riverfront Bengal Show. We will entertain. You can join. You can join the literal singles of us. I can't even say dozens. They're not even dozens of us. There's like nine people that listen to that show, but they are having a blast. They are so much fun. So the first question from Joe: What's your dream Reds caravan, Deus? So there were six on in that picture I was looking at earlier. So what's the dream on a Reds caravan? Uh, okay, so I'm going to put Joey Votto on there. You pick one now. Oh, who is on it? I saw this question. I'm like, does he want me to pick like a unique podium that I'm standing in front of? Like, <laughs> what, where do I go with this? Adam Dunn. Adam Dunn for sure. Got to have Dunner. Got to have Dunner. Yeah. Um, probably Jake Fraley. No, let me wait. Let me rethink that. Um, uh, who else? You know, um, do you want one of the guy, old guys? I don't know. We lean too heavily into the old guy, you know, the big red machine stuff. So, you know, I mean, yeah, you want to say maybe Johnny Bench, but yeah, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to use my pick on Lisa Alberto Bonilla. Ooh. So there you go. I'm up in the ante for you. Uh, I'm going to. I, I want some charisma up there. I want somebody that's really going to unify the group. So give me, give me Sean Casey. Oh, Sean Casey, good one, good one. I think I'm going to go with one of the guys that was actually on the in the picture I saw from one of the stops, Bronson Arroyo. Bronson Arroyo is a happy-go-lucky guy, always a good interview. Um, was very kind to my son once at uh, the Reds, uh, what do they call it, kids opening day or whatever. And so uh, that's what I'm going with. I have a soft spot for Bronson Arroyo. Well, uh, any, any legendary squad needs to have the wild card, so I'm bringing back Yaziel Puig. Oh, no, that would – Indeed, be a wild, <laughs> wild card. Next question comes from Joey Gaditza. As always, these questions come from our friends at patreon.com slash riverfront Cincy. That is patreon.com slash riverfront Cincy. Joey Gaditza's question, if Adam Dunn was a Bengal, what position would he play? I'm giving this one to you, Nate. You're the you're the Bengal guy. Um he would he would gladly back up Joe Burrow quarterback, because as people should know, Adam Dunn was a quarterback for the University of Texas. But I think he uh he'd slot in as a nice modern day tight end. You know, people forget back when his uh his like last year in Louisville, he was he can move around out there before he put oh, on yeah. some of that donkey weight. So uh that's true. I see him being a tight end. Yeah, listen, you don't get recruited to play football at Texas if you're not an athlete. So Adam Dunn uh, would play be a tight end, I'd say that's right. Um next question from Gary Hilliard. Gary asks this, from best to worst, who is best at BSing? Nick Naylor, that's the character played by Aaron Eckhart in Thank You for Smoking, which I had I'd forgotten about that movie and went back and watched a couple quick clips. And that's a good movie. I like that movie. And yes, he is BSing all, all throughout that movie. So who's the best? Nick Naylor, Chad, that's, that's me, or Gary Parrish from the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast? I guess I have to answer this one. I don't know if you have any any thoughts, Nate. Uh, it's like it's only just to reiterate what you said. Thank you, Gary, for reminding me about thank you for smoking because Aaron, Aaron Eckhart's character in that movie is awesome. Fantastic. But yeah, I don't listen to this podcast guy. Well, uh, I um, uh, I guess I'm going to say um, it's Aaron Eckhart, but I have to say I've been waiting for someone to ask a similar question because 
I listen to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast all the time, and I steal from Gary Parish all the time. <laughs> I steal things from him all. He, he makes me laugh. That show is uh, they do it's 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 Gary Parish and Matt Norlander from CBS Sports, and um, they just they have fun. And so I, you know, uh, I have stolen things over the years uh, from the delivery and everything because I think he's pretty good at uh, what he does. Um, that is that is one of the podcasts that I listen to always. Nate, do you have any? Go to podcasts. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the guys over at uh, John Boy Media. I'll definitely hijack some of their baseball content sometimes. I mentioned Chris Rose rotation earlier. Um, they uh, on their talking baseball podcast. They did one I wish we would have done so many times. They they ranked. They did a draft of baseball movies, characters, and scenes. And. Man, I can, we, we could do a five-hour podcast just talking about uh, yeah, our favorite baseball movies and then drafting them accordingly. So, oh, man. love those guys. That's fantastic. I'm just going to scroll through my app here, and here are the, here are the podcasts that I try not to miss. Uh, the Big Picture, it's a, a movie podcast from The Ringer. That's uh, by far the best. Um, let's see here. The Cavs Corner podcast, is a Virginia Cavalier one, and the Casual Hoya podcast, which is not – it's not great and they don't post it very often, but there aren't very many Georgetown Hoya podcasts. Um, I don't college basketball. There it is. That might be scroll. That might be it for um, us to the, uh, the locked on reds podcast, locked on bangles. Um, the athletic has a great bangles podcast to hear that podcast growling. Um, yeah. RIP to our friends over at late night reds talk. Yeah, um, that late That's podcast nice. was was a good one. The rewatchables, okay. rewatchables That's a great one. is dope. It's Anytime the they do a movie that I've seen multiple times, that's a, it's a must listen. Yeah, and I guess the only other two are uh, one called uh, "The View from the Lane." It's an uh, the athletic podcast about Tottenham Hotspur, and then of course the amazing, the unbelievable, the award winning. The Riverfront Bengal Show, <laughs> by far my favorite show, by far. I appreciate so, again, you I, subscribing, even though you don't listen, just so we get that statistic. Thank you. <laughs> I turn it on in the background. <laughs> get you that download. Um, okay, so the next question from Kyle Kapler. Kyle says, "I'm excited about Derek Law. Just think of the nicknames he will receive." Speaking of the bullpen, what is your best pitch for the bullpen to be above average this season? Pun definitely intended. I think you just answered that question earlier, didn't you, Nate? I made it. We um, we need to have a resurgent uh, buck farmer season. That's it. Resurgent buck farmers. Say that very carefully, by the way. Rich Thompson. Rich is back with another one of his multiple choice questions. He, since it is highly unlikely that the Reds will be contending this coming. Hey, wait, what? Highly unlikely. We just told you that they are going to be rich. Come on. Jeez. Give it the program, Rich Thompson. How dare you? And possibly not in 2024 either. Rich, how dare you speak the truth? Where do you think the Reds need to either acquire or develop talent over the next couple of years? A, starting pitching, B, outfield, C, first base, or D, their marketing department to encourage or lure fans to attend Reds games over the next couple of seasons? I'm firmly, I'm firmly on board with D. That marketing department is going to work hard. That they've got to figure out how to market this mess. What do you think, Nate? I'm going to take the easy way out here and uh, include an E option for all of the above. Yeah, yeah. Probably if I'm doing one, uh, the outfield is probably my number one out of those. But yeah, yeah, all of them. Thanks for the question, Rich. Seth Shaner in a parallel universe. And th this is a good question. It's something I've thought about occasionally. But I don't know we've talked about it a whole lot here. Some maybe. If the Reds were doing what the Bengals are doing now, made it to the World Series, lost in seven, but are challenging for a title in the postseason as we speak, would the city and Reds country be as hyped up as the current reality that surrounds the Bengals? Or is football just more conducive to hysteria than baseball? That's you know, a good I, question. It is a good question. I, I hope you have a good answer because I'm not sure that I do. I think yes. Given the similarities in a crap franchise for many years and then you know come around and be, you know, literally maybe the best team in football. Uh, to do that on the baseball side, I think especially initially, uh, it would be that 
excitement, enthusiasm. You and I were both there at that first playoff game mm -hmm. in 2010, and that place was rocking. Now, I don't know if that you can sustain that because you have longer series, and football is just more conducive to the you know uh, hysteria. But I think there would it'd be it'd be different. But I think the passion for the Reds runs so deeply. That's why I say if they just they've lost a generation of fans, I fear. But I, I also think that if they just win and win big, everybody's going to be back, and it's going to be you know the the. The bandwagon is going to get full like it is with the Bengals. So, so I like to think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I would love to have um, you know real life evidence to support this claim, but I I agree with you, and I think it's because you know it's easy to be a football fan. You really only have to do it once a week, or when you're taking a dump and on Twitter. So. You don't have like it is, it's more conducive to hysteria. You can just go wacky on a Sunday and then table it until the next Sunday. Baseball is such a long, slow burn. But if the Reds are good, you're excited, increasingly so, for 162 games and then the playoffs. And if they lose a game, there's another one the next day. And the crowd knows they need to be there to support their team. So, yeah, I think that's given the opportunity to root for a World Series contender. Cincinnati would be pure insanity. I still have my 2012 World Series tickets that I bought. Um, but you know what? They sent me a refund <laughs> to quote uh, the immortal Joe Burrow. Um, all right. Next question. Just got a couple left here. We'll power through them. Brandon Kamick, if you could add any player to this roster for 2023 only, current or former, who would it be? And why would it be Kyle Farmer? Didn't have to think about this one because the answer is him. It's obvious why it would be Kyle Farmer. Best player ever, man. Hooper Willie Powell. Mopena. Willie Mopena. No, the answer to all these questions are obviously always Adam Dunn. Current or former? I just want Adam Dunn on every roster. Last question, Hooper Powell. Chad, I have front row tickets for you to the Oscars. The only thing is you have to drive there with either Bruce Springsteen, Mark Ruffalo, or Phil Castellini. Who would you choose, or would you not go at all? I spend entirely too much time thinking about this question, Hooper. <laughs> so you, I, you owe me an you owe me an apology. I'm, I'm not good at talking. Um, so my initial thought was, well, I'm just not going to go. But I mean, I'd like to go to the Oscars. That'd be fun. You know, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, I don't dislike Bruce Springsteen. I mean, I don't know him, but I just think he's overrated as a musician. He's a perfectly cromulent musician, just overrated. So maybe uh, maybe Springsteen. Ruffalo, you know, he has been known for years, well-known everywhere as my arch nemesis. Um, I thought, could I just, could I bury the hatchet with him? Go to the Oscars? But go watch, pick any random movie of his and see how badly he overacts. And I just don't want to see him getting excited for somebody winning or getting disappointed because he's going to be getting way too crazy or way too down. I just can't, I can't deal with that. So he's out. And, but, but the real answer here is it's absolutely 100% Phil Castellini. I would like to go to the Oscars with Phil Castellini. And here's why. I would love to see how badly he would embarrass himself in <laughs> front of uh, famous people who have, you know, uh, reached the top of their profession. Whereas he was handed a spot at the bottom of his profession um, and is making it worse. I would love to go see how he would suck up to everybody in the room. Just what kind of a clown would he make of himself? It, it would be, it'd be hilarious. It would be absolutely hilarious. I'd live tweet the whole thing. It would be amazing. Just let me go. We'll get in the car with him and cut some payroll on the way to the Oscars. That's the answer. Right or wrong answer, Nate. That's too good. Um, you did you did spend some time thinking about that one. Um, I thought you would go with Springsteen just because he's like a million years old and there's a 50-50 chance he'll just fall asleep the whole time. <laughs> right. So right get cool. out scotch-free. Um, Phil, if, if you go with Phil, you just got to be prepared. He's going to make you pay for the Uber. Probably, but he also may have the high-end Coke. So, you know, I mean, that could be – wait, 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 never mind. Strike that from the record, <laughs> Your Honor. All right, Nate, you've kind of already talked about what else is going on around the riverfront, but anything else you want to want to add? 
No, that's that big, big giant who day. Uh, exciting game this Sunday. So I'm sure the city's going to turn out and hopefully they'll make their way over to Kansas City. And uh, we can keep talking about them continuing this winning streak for a couple more weeks. And exciting news the Riverfront Bengal Show has a TikTok account. Woo. All you kids need to go and, uh, and follow on TikTok. And it's actually incredible engagement there. I, I'm amazed at the. Uh, yeah, at shout that. out to um, our patron. Clay Christian, who uh, is running that for us and kicking butt. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not much of a TikToker, but I get on there every once in a while. J- recently, just to see how it's doing, and I like it. Good stuff. So, all right. Well, thank you to everyone for listening and supporting the Riverfront. Please remember to subscribe to the show either on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're at Riverfront Cincy on all those platforms. And once again, a huge thank to our support. Thank you to our supporters at patreon.com slash Riverfront Cincy. The show would not be possible without the support of our Patreon family. So come join us. Patreon.com slash Riverfront Cincy. I apologize for my voice this week. I'll be back to good as new next week to the, the voice that you learned to hate over low these many years. All right, shout out to Adam Dunn. Shouts to Lisa Alberto and Wayne Krenchicki. And yes, Gary Parrish, the legend. For Nate Dotson, this is Chad Dotson saying so long, everyone.